the Mental Health Spectrum Part 2 Personality Disorders, or as I like to call them, Response Patterns. And you'll hear more about that in Part 1. So if you haven't seen Part 1, please go ahead and click to Part 1 now, where we'll sort of explain sort of what we're talking about here. But let's just jump into this Part 2, and then there'll also be a Part 3 for Personality Disorders, because there is kind of a lot of Personality Disorders, and it's very useful for you and other people to be aware of the common features. Hi, my name is Jesse. Welcome to my channel, Open Source Owners, where we talk about what if we had an owner's manual. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so Personality Disorders or Response Patterns. Uh, there are, remember, this is just an overview. There's Cluster A, Cluster B, and Cluster C. Now, these cluster modes aren't really used so much in the... Um, in the mental health space, it, these cluster, these clusters are no longer used sort of um, in the DSM, but uh, a lot of therapists still use them to sort of chunk and understand sort of common patterns. And I like them because they do tend to break down, and this is a very generalized statement, so it's not true for every case, but they tend to break down uh, connected to attachment styles. So today we're going to be talking about cluster B traits, as you can see here. Those are the more dramatic, emotional, or erratic behavior traits. And those are the four categories in that cluster B domain. And remember, these are all personality disorders, or as I call them, personality response patterns. Uh, borderline, antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic. Uh, all of those are interesting. That's what this video is about. But I want to just remind you, this cluster B world that we're going to be talking about in this video is linked to very commonly, again, not always, disorganized attachment styles. So these patterns, these personality disorders, they don't just arise out of nowhere. They come from you know, an environment and a relationship environment where their attachment models are being strained or wounded or threatened quite often. And, and if you know anything about attachment, you know that the disorganized style is kind of the most chaotic. The disorganized attachment style often involves uh, parental figures or caregivers that are abusive, neglectful, uh, alcohol addicted, drug addicted, undiagnosed schizophrenics, undiagnosed bipolar. It's a chaotic environment for a child to live in. And by age two, their attachment model is, is pretty well established um, all, all the way until they die, typically. Um, and we can change that. So don't fret. Um, that is something that we can change through the power of, you know, neuroplasticity, but also the power of our intention and our attention, what we're focusing on and how we're growing our own self. So without further ado, let's get into it. Just keep in mind, we're going through the cluster B traits today, and these are all linked to disorganized attachment commonly. All right, the first one, borderline personality disorder, or as I call it, borderline response pattern. This is characterized by a personality of instability and interpersonal relationships. So there's that attachment piece again. Self-image, which also develops from attachment. Affect, so emotion, and marked impulsivity. So you probably have known many individuals who uh, have borderline personality disorder, and it's not our job to diagnose other people, but it is our job to understand patterns and understand why relationships are challenging or not um, to, to grow a better world, to grow a better version of ourselves. So those with borderline personality disorder are highly worried that people don't like them. Uh, Dr. Oldham, you can look him up. He's sort of an expert in this space. They imagine this so vividly that they may start arguing with the person when the person wasn't even thinking about them. So often it's unprovoked worry that someone else is mad at them or thinking ill of them or something like that. Uh, the person's relationships get rocky because they're so insecure. Individuals with borderline personality disorder tend to be antagonistic and antisocial and may injure themselves by cutting or burning themselves. Impulsive choices and behaviors is another feature of uh, this trait, um, and those often result in risky behaviors such as gambling or shopping sprees or engaging in unprotected sex with multiple partners. Uh, they, they tend to have powerful, changeable emotions and moods that last from a few hours to a few days. Now, this is one of the uh, ways to demarcate whether someone has bipolar, like manic depressive states, where they go into a state of mania, or borderline where they have these wildly changeable moods. And one way to just think about it is borderline, what we're talking about here, um, that presentation, those response patterns typically have very intense emotions throughout a day or even several hours, like could have been the best day ever and then the worst day ever very, very quickly. Whereas bipolar with a full on manic or even a hypomanic stage, there will be a, 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 a period of weeks often that they're in that manic stage. They're just revving and, and functioning on all cylinders. They're just revving on all cylinders for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then they do similar things, gambling, shopping sprees, etc. Um, so you kind of know the difference between just the length of time those behaviors cycle. And then the last one, a pattern of turbulent and unstable relationships with friends and family. So relationships are very challenging, very chaotic, and you might say very disorganized. 
which is why I'm linking this to the disorganized attachment. And we'll continue here. Uh, feeling Maybe feeling constantly bored and or empty, like that feeling of emptiness inside. Sometimes there's imposter syndrome creeping up in this sort of place. Uh, often borderline uh, traits involve anger issues, difficulty controlling intense anger, um, and having outbursts um, to sort of gain control or gain emotional connection even, even if it's through anger or violence. Uh, a distorted and insecure concept of self uh, that affects really everything in your life, from relationships to your goals, to your moods, and to even your opinions, to who you are, your self-identity. Paranoid thoughts and or dissociative feelings. Now, this is critical. This is a critical glimpse into how the disorganized attachment plays into the borderline personality disorder um, through that dissociation factor. When, when a child is growing up under violence or neglect, um, they can't help but go into dissociation as a survival strategy. If you think about that through the vagus nerve, that's called the dorsal dive sometimes. It's just pure survival. It's It, it gets initiated under life threat, the perception of life threat. It's not just a perception of, you know, maybe there's some danger. It's a perception of you might literally die in this scenario. So shut down, do everything you can to go into the dissociative state, which involves, you know, endorphins that are released in you that are just as strong as heroin. So we literally sort of dissociate and check out. And often borderline patients and anybody with a disorganized attachment style will have blank spots on their memory. They'll be like, I don't remember that time frame or, or they vaguely recall something bad happened to me, but I don't know what it was, that type of thing. Um, so feeling like you're out of your, um, that this isn't your life or that you're out of your body. Um, often uh, connected to that, they might engage in sexual activity, but not feel it. It'll, they'll be very, very numb. They're just sort of doing it, you know, maybe as a distraction or something. They'll do the same thing with cutting or self-harming, sort of not feeling what they're, the damage that they're doing to themselves because they're so dissociated. And then again, that's a powerful effect of the chemicals that are associated with this sort of like survival strategy. An irrational fear of being abandoned that causes powerful emotions to go to extremes to make sure that you aren't abandoned. And ironically, unfortunately, this these powerful emotions that try to prevent you from being abandoned often will push your partners and your relationships even further away. And then you are, in fact, abandoned. Um, or at least it seems that way. Um, abandonment might be strong there. It's like you can't expect a partner to be in a relationship with someone who's that disorganized. It's just too chaotic. For most people. And uh, one of the high features of borderline uh, response patterns is suicidal or self-harming behavior. So things like cutting, it could be any type of skin picking or any type of like multiple suicide attempts. This typically isn't just, oh, I attempted suicide once when I was 16 and really depressed after my parents got a divorce. So this is more like I've had multiple attempts of suicide over multiple years and it never leaves my mind as a sort of a, a way out, a, a sort of the trump card or the ultimate coping skill is often how patients think of this is like, well, if all else fails, at least I have suicide. Suicide's on the table in the borderline uh, response patterns. Okay, so that's borderline in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it, but again, you'll know a lot of individuals with borderline personality disorder. You'll maybe have relationships with them, be it friendships or partnerships. Um, now the antisocial personality disorder or response pattern is less common, but you've definitely come across these individuals in life. Um, and this again is connected, at least in my estimation, to a disorganized attachment style. And this entails a pattern of behavior that is marked by a disregard for and a violation of the, of the rights of others. So hence antisocial. They're not playing the human game very well, <laughs> uh, at least from the societal standpoint. These individuals often fail to conform to social norms, which may result in repetitive arrest and criminal behavior. Um, and these individual individuals may wind up in jail. So you do in fact see a lot of antisocial um, behaviors and tendencies in prisons and in, in, in the prison system, especially in America, but probably elsewhere. Um, males with antisocial behavior tend to break the law, disregard rules and conduct, and may be manipulative and reckless. They show no remorse for the things that they do, and of course, they don't conform to the social norms. Um, so it's that no remorse factor. It's like, well, I got caught. That's the only thing I really sort of regret about this. I don't feel bad for the other people that I've harmed or, you know, in some way violated. Uh, they may begin displaying symptoms during childhood, of course, especially if we think about it as an attachment feature. Um, is this is a, an attachment wound that develops into a personality disorder 18 and older. Um, such behaviors may include uh, fire setting, cruelty to animals, and difficulty with authority. 
And often they'll have legal problems, of course, resulting from these failures to sort of care about what society's norms are, etc. As 18 and younger, and so as non-adults, this, this is often um, diagnosed as conduct disorder. So like that fire setting, cruelty to animals. Obviously, for anybody who's psychologically minded, you'll know that those things tend to link to like, watch out, you might have a killer on your hands, like a serial killer type person, um, which again is typified by an antisocial personality d disorder. Um, or you might even say like a, a psychopathic or a sociopathic tendency. And all those would sort of crap, fall under this antisocial pattern, right? But again, remember as younger uh, children, it's not diagnosed this way. It's diagnosed as often referred to as conduct disorder. So let's continue and finish antisocial response patterns. They often act out impulsively and fail to consider the consequences of their action, especially from a societal or a legal perspective. Uh, and, uh, of course, from a moral perspective, they're not thinking morally, they're thinking completely, I must get my needs met. In a way, this is deeply narcissistic, right? And, in fact, all of these these cluster B traits are all kind of on a narcissistic uh, spectrum, in a way. Borderline is highly narcissistic. Um, histrionic it is highly narcissistic, so is antisocial. That's because you have a disorganized attachment style. All one can do in those scenarios is try your best to manage your own self and try your best to sort of, like, soothe the intensity of the emotion and the insecurity of the relationships that you have, you naturally will become narcissistic. You naturally will be become self-focused. You have to be to survive. So it's no wonder, right? Uh, they're often having displays of aggressiveness and irritability that often lead to physical assaults. Um, one of the reasons why prisons are so physically dangerous in terms of assault is because of the high concentration of these types of response patterns, um, have difficulty feeling empathy for others and may not, in fact, be able to. Um, this inability of to consider thoughts, feelings, and motivations of other people can lead to disregard for other people, of course. Uh, display a lack of remorse for any damaging behavior, even if it's with their children or their partners, and often have poor and abusive adult relationships with others and are more likely to abuse and neglect children. So again, this gets into the pedophilia sort of space. Um, it's much more likely that uh, to be... Um, to have those proclivities and to engage in that sort of immoral behavior, that you probably have antisocial personality disorder or antisocial response patterns. Basically, you're a deeply wounded person. And of course, statistically, if you were abused as a child, that makes you much more likely to abuse others as a child, as horrible as all that is. It's important to understand the pathology, the etiology, how, how we get from a beautiful baby child who's pure and innocent to the world to someone who can harm others and particularly harm the most vulnerable of us, right? The children. Um, and the last thing on antisocial is frequently lie and deceive others for personal gain with no remorse, of course. Okay, cool. So we got two more to go. Hope you're enjoying this. It's kind of a quick overview, but hopefully you're sort of like some bells are going off and you're making some dot connections between maybe people that you've known in your life, people you grew up with or people that you work with. Um, another very common one uh, that you will see, kind of like borderline, you'll see borderline a lot within your social circles. You'll also see narcissism a lot and narcissistic personality disorder, or as I call it, narcissistic response pattern, right? Uh, often, this involves a pattern of grandiose behaviors with an exaggerated sense of self. That's the whole point of narcissism is it's very self, me, me, me. It's uh, I, me, mine. It's as George Harrison would say. It's all about what I can get out of this scenario, this relationship, this, this uh, life that I have. Uh, these individuals are preoccupied with unrealistic images of power and success and may often find others inferior to them. They may also be so attracted to power that they climb the ranks of power. And we live in a power... Um, hierarchy in the world, I would say the, the global power hierarchy rewards narcissistic behavior. It even rewards antisocial behavior. It rewards people who are willing to step on other people's throats and backs to get to where they need to. It rewards people who are willing to lie, deceive, and cheat to get to where to the get to that next level of power. In fact, there are there is some research that suggests that um, I forget the numbers, but you're something like 20% more likely to find narcissists uh, and the narcissistic personality disorders in the upper echelons of, of the business uh, elite, the most powerful and successful businesses in the world, have a disproportionate number of narcissistic personality disordered individuals at those top levels, in the CEO levels and the bureaucratic levels. Um, that's the one study I'm aware of. I would almost guarantee you that it's true for politics, too. I have not seen a study on that, but 
I mean, come on, right? Who is going to climb to the ranks of a bureaucratic power system more than like a narcissist who doesn't have qualms about lying or cheating or stealing or saying what they need to say or doing what they need to do? The, the narcissist tends to believe that he or she is special and unique and sort of requires excessive admiration from others. Uh, these individuals are not very good at having empathy, nor are they interested in trying to understand how people feel. Uh, an exaggerated sense of one's own abilities and achievements, um, which may or may not correlate to real the real world, right? They think they're the best cook or golf player or, you know, bartender or most charming individual at the party, but really most people don't see them that way. They see themselves that way, though. Uh, there's a constant need for attention, affirmation, and praise. So keep in mind here, attention could be negative or positive. They don't necessarily care if it's like warm, loving attention. It could just be any type of attention. So a fight is better than not being noticed or not being paid attention to. A belief that he or she is unique, special, and should only associate with other people of the same status. So the tribalism of this makes um, begins to make more sense, too, when we think about higher level power in corporations and governments. Um, there's that sort of status, what we would call the elite, um, which I don't really like that phrase because they, they've not proven that they're the elite classes of empathy or the elite classes of wisdom. <laughs> they're far from that. Um, and then there's persistent fantasies about attaining success and power. So a lot of focus on uh, success and power, right? And continued exploiting other people for personal gain, uh, a sense of entitlement. That word is really critical where they feel like the world owes them X, Y, or Z, or the wife owes them X, Y, or Z, etc. Expectation of special treatment, of course, is what entitlement sort of is. A preoccupation with power or success, which we've already said. Feeling envious of others, so seeing others who seem to have what they want, whether it's wealth or status. And believing that others um, in turn are also envious of him or her. I have the new Lexus, you know, I'm sure everybody's so envious. And meanwhile, most people who don't have these personality disorders are not envious at all. We're just like, okay, that guy's got money, big deal. Uh, a lack of empathy for others. Again, we're going over the same territory. Okay, so one of the things with narcissists uh, developing this response pattern in early childhood and attachment theory would be that you were raised by a narcissistic parent. That could be one way that you model to become then a narcissist later in your life. So that's very typical. Like, um, it's not always the case, but often you get that cold attention, that very, very sort of like um, reserved amount of love as a child from your mom or dad. Typically it's dad. Um, and then you learn to sort of like regulate your own emotional needs and you learn to meter out your love and your ability to connect with other people the same way that you were modeled, uh, it was modeled to you by your father, say, right? Um, that's not the only way, but that's very, very common. Okay, let's move on. Histrionic response patterns. This is the last one, I think, in the in the cluster B trait. So we're almost done. Hang in there. Thanks for making it this far. Histrionic really refers to attention-seeking behaviors, right? Which may entail um, a heightened sense of dramatization and inappropriate sexual or provocative behavior. So trying to get attention upon them in any way, shape, or form. So they'll be provocative. They'll be dramatic. They'll often lie about a drama that happened to them that really didn't happen to them to get the attention of others. Um, display excessive but shallow emotions and attention-seeking behaviors. These individuals are constantly performing in order to gain attention. Now, be careful because teenagers sometimes do some of these things, right? There's attention seeking, there's provocativeness, um, they're exploring their sexuality, so they might not know how to sort of like be appropriate with it. So it might seem that way, but most teenagers would not have a histrionic personality disorder. You have to really, well, first of all, you have to be 18 or older to have this style, but it's not just sort of like normal attention, normal, like trying on different personalities and trying on different fads or trying to be a certain way or another. This goes beyond that. Um, they often experience fleeting moods, opinions, and beliefs, and are they're very suggestible and quick to doing fads and jumping on the latest fad because their identity is so sort of weak that they're willing to, they want to sort of perform. It's like peacocking. They just want to sort of get attention. They don't really care how they get that attention. Uh, generally, they need others to witness their emotional display. So we see a lot of that on like TikTok and things like that in order to gain validation or attention. Uh, often displaying exaggerated symptoms of weakness and illness and may use threats of suicide to manipulate others. Um, many people with this disorder are, are often sexually provocative 
And they use that sexual provocative, uh, provocative nature or behavior, not for sex, not for like, it feels good. Typically it's more for them. It's more about control of others and control of others attention in particular. Um, now, if you tie histrionic into the disorganized attachment style, um, you can start to understand that in a, in a chaotic environment, let's imagine a scenario where a somebody who will eventually become histrionic um, is in a disorganized attachment environment in, as an early child, right? Let's say there's lots of siblings around. Mom has undiagnosed bipolar, so she goes through manic phases and depressive phases. Now, all these kids that are around dealing with mom's uh, bipolar uh, do not know that she has bipolar. They just know that mom gets really cold and like, emotionally blunted and shut down at times during her depression phase, but then also like incredibly vibrant and incredibly like energetic and doing all sorts of crazy things like taking the kids on spontaneous vacations when she's in the manic phase, right? Now, some of these children will probably naturally grow to ha have this response pattern that we then call histrionic, where they're like, I must get the attention of my mother and they'll try anything they can. So they become maybe even like actor type individuals will do this. And it, obviously I'm not saying all actors have this. I'm just saying many people who feel like they have to act to get attention. So even in, in their adult relationships, they have to perform for their partner in order to, to feel validated, to feel seen, etc. Okay, so that was a lot. That was the cluster B traits. That's sort of that erratic and sort of confusing chaos uh, version of the personality disorders. Those are very difficult personality disorders to live with. So please have empathy for anybody you know who's on those on that spectrum that we just covered. That does not mean just because we have empathy for them that we don't set boundaries and the, the, you allow those individuals to harm you or to degrade your quality of life. So there has to be a, a way that we protect ourselves but still re retain empathy and understand what's going on with these individuals. Um, now, Borderline personality disorder will often get treatment. Um, histrionic personality disorder will often see in treatment. But the antisocial and the narcissistic response patterns or personality disorders tend to resist treatment. They do not want to. Well, I mean, they think they're. They tend to think they're great or above the the judgment of other people. So why would they want to go sit with a psychiatrist or a psychologist, be analyzed, be told that they are messed up, be made to look at some of their behaviors and then be asked to change? That's a really tall order. Now it can get there. Um, and one of the things that I think I wanna just throw into this conversation about these personality disorders in particular is psychedelic assisted therapy of the MDMA variety. So MDMA is a, a compound that it, on the street, it's referred to as ecstasy, obviously, don't just do ecstasy um, because you don't know what's in it, et cetera. But if you can get into a psychedelic assisted therapy session and bring in and uh, somebody with antisocial personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic, what you're going to do is you're going to flood the body with prolactin and oxytocin. And both of those are sort of bonding um, and sort of connection hormones that basically trick the mind into being able to look at the things that we've done wrong or the wounded child within us without feeling defensiveness. So we sort of like, there's this compound in the world that allows us to put aside our defense mechanisms, our control mechanisms to actually empathize with other people and maybe more importantly, empathize with ourselves and the wounded parts of ourselves. So as much as we don't really have great treatments for antisocial and um, narcissistic personality disorders because they would kind of have to want it, um, there is this new class that goes beyond just sort of uh, talk therapy, which I love and I'm, I'm a total fan of, but um, I think we want the whole spectrum. We want the whole suite of possible treatments. Uh, MDMA is sometimes in the psychedelic communities referred to as an empathogen. It opens up spaces within humans that makes us... Um, maybe not makes us, but allows us access to true empathy without trying. We don't have to try it. It's just the, the way that the chemical cascade occurs, we open ourselves up to empathy. And that could be a huge life-changing thing. This could be how we begin to rewrite those uh, attachment patterns and we begin to sort of own up to some of the, the damage that we've done in our relationships. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, please download your free 60 page ebook called The Owner's Manual Part 2. It's full of great information. Um, and I just give it to people at the end as a gift saying, hey, thanks for watching the video all the way through the end. Enjoy it. It'll come to your email. Click the link below. So that was the Mental Health Spectrum Part 2 where we're still talking about personality response patterns. And we have one more video coming up about the personality 
response patterns. We're going to cover cluster C in part three, and then we'll have a few other parts where we cover mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and psychotic disorders. It's so fun around here, isn't it? But I think this information needs to be distributed. I think people need to recognize what this is so that they can navigate their world a little bit better. That makes our uh, our way to, um, this makes our sense making about the world much better more detailed and much more nuanced if we can begin to understand again we're not judging we're not trying to label people certainly don't tell somebody that you think they have x personality disorder they're not going to respond well to that uh, but you can send them a video or something like that um, but yeah it helps us navigate the world and if you think so give it a like give it a comment give it a bell give it a subscription all the YouTube things, um, particularly comment. I love to hear comments. So what did this, um, what did cluster B make you think of? Have you known people with cluster B traits? Tell me, tell, tell us all as we read through the comments a little bit about what your experience was, or maybe you recovered from having borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. Maybe your parents were, whoa, wow, that was mom to a T and you had an aha moment. I want to hear about it. That's the best part of making YouTube is interacting with the audience. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. I will see you in the next video. Take care out there.